As you may have noticed in your bulletin, we're going to take a brief break from uh, the prophet Zephaniah today and from the series in those prophets uh, to turn instead to the letter to the Hebrews and there to chapter 11. We'll pick up in Hebrews 11 at verse 32. Today, from Dublin to uh, this is page 1008 in your pre Bible, if that helps. Today, uh, from Dublin to the, uh, the dyed green Chicago River, uh, millions are celebrating what's become a major holiday. Uh, it is, of course, St. Patrick's Day. Happens the 17th of every March. Alas, the holiday has become, as you know, little more than another excuse to get drunk and rowdy, while the genuine St. Patrick has disappeared from view. We have tales about him, of course, driving snakes out of Ireland, uh, which, by the way, never happened. There were no snakes in Ireland, according to a document that precedes Patrick's time. Uh, stories of contests unto death with Druid priests. And, of course, you remember using the shamrock to explain the Trinity to the pagans. Uh, as I say, I'm, well, those things don't even come close to the genuine Patrick. But uh, what have we done, particularly we Protestants, to unearth the truth buried under all the tales? Well, precious little. Because we have, even if subconsciously, assigned Patrick a place in our mind with those many quote-unquote saints who have nothing to do with the true gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Patrick, however, was a true evangelical. That is to say, he was committed to, and he preached, and he spread, and he suffered for the evangel, the good news, the gospel. He was a true saint. In the biblical is, in the sense of the word that this holiday uh, or should rightly celebrate. Uh, this day does belong to the saints, to us. The Bible exhorts us to, to consider the faith of the saints who've gone before us, this cloud of witnesses, as Scripture calls them, and to imitate their own faith in our own lives. And so we're going to seek to do that, reading Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 32, after we pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the ministry that we have received from all three persons of the one true and living God. And now we pray that we may hear the voice of our God and respond with faith, obedient faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A famous chapter, I say, we, we sometimes call this Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith. Uh, earlier in the chapter, uh, the writer has named several biblical saints one by one who must serve as exemplars for our faith. But then he turns and he says this in verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and forced justice obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even in chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. <clears throat> and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. For since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, 
they should not be made perfect. Great heroes of the Christian faith, according to the Bible itself, are not um, restricted to the Bible's pages alone. God in His sovereign providence has provided us a long, long history of faithful Christians who've been obedient, even to the shedding of blood. One of those faithful examples is Patrick. St. Patrick, or Patricius, as he was known in the Latin of his day, was a nobleman by birth. His very name means noble of the patrician class, the group who had ruled Rome ever since Romulus and Remus legendarily founded the city a thousand years earlier. Born in Britain in the late 4th century at a time when that island was under the rule of the Roman Empire, he was, according to his own account, the son of a deacon of the church and the grandson of a priest. His family was, as you have probably already surmised, a well-to-do British family in the closing years of the 4th century, the later 300s. They had uh, both a home in town and a country villa. Patrick lived a privileged life as a young man. He started down the path of an excellent education until everything was abruptly turned upside down in the darkness and confusion of one terrible night. As the 15-year-old boy lay fast asleep in his family's villa, of a sudden, Irish Raiders who had glided silently across the sea fell upon them. Ripped from his sleep, Patrick was thrown to the floor and bound in iron chains. And next thing he knew, he was being loaded on a boat from which he watched in horror as those who were either too old or too young to be of value, infants and old men, Friends and relatives were brutally slain to make room on the ships for those who would fetch a good price on the slave market. The journey across the Irish Sea would take more, no more than a day or two, depending on where they were to land on Ireland's east coast. And once there, chained at intervals about three feet apart, he and the others were brought to the slave market. For six grueling years, he worked for his master in the distant northwest of Ireland, the edge of the world, as Patrick himself would describe it later. Every day, rain or shine, summer or winter, cold or heat, he tended the sheep. But it was also during this terrible time that Patrick drew near to God, and God drew near to him. He remembered in those fields, those pastures, what he had heard as a child. He remembered the voice of his minister who had pleaded with and commanded the congregation to take the Christian life with full seriousness. How utterly indifferent he had been to that call and to that instruction. But now he began to pray and to live as a Christian. Patrick later recalled that God used the time to shape and mold me into something better. He made me into what I am now, someone very different from what I once was, someone who can care about others and and work to help them. Before I was a slave, I didn't even care about myself. Then came the bold escape. The long, long trek on foot across the rough terrain, evading the hostile tribes of Ireland at every single turn until he reached the Irish coast opposite England, where he asked the ship's captain if he could join the ship's crew, spotting him, no doubt, as a runaway slave and wanting nothing to do with those kind of complications. The captain said, forget about it. I wonder if you said it with that New York accent. Forget about it. Uh, forget about it. He said, there's no way you're going with us. Now what to do? He turned and praying earnestly in his heart began seeking a place to hide where he would not be 
arrested. But then he heard the voice of some of the sailors from that same ship calling to him and offering to take him back to the captain, which they did. And still surly, he finally offered Patrick a position on the crew. And after some more adventures, Patrick finally arrived at home where his family received him with great delight. So after many years, wrote Patrick, I finally returned home to my family in Britain. They took me in, their long-lost son, and begged me earnestly that after all I had been through, I would never leave them again. And he would happily have obliged. But then came a most remarkable call. Call to ministry. Like the Apostle Paul's Macedonian calling, Patrick heard in a dream Irish voices calling him, Holy boy! That's what they had called him with their derogatory nickname while he was a slave among them. Holy boy, come here and walk among us. It was all that he needed. Patrick's love for Christ translated into love for his enemies, even those who had so terribly brutalized him. Even the savage Irish, after all, needed a savior, and so Patrick spent some years training for the gospel ministry. Well, you can imagine how difficult it must have been. I mean, not only were the Irish savagely brutal, but they were thoroughly pagan. Patrick's ministry would be received as a threat, especially by the Druids, uh, before he even left home, many, many people, including his own family, pled and begged with him to stay, trying to talk him out of going to the place where he had been so terribly mistreated and now could certainly be enslaved again or much worse. Well, Patrick did not relent. Their warnings came true. Patrick's life in Ireland was hard, to say the very least. He was beaten several times to within an inch of his life. He suffered the oppression of the Druids, who viewed his ministry as a threat to their authority among the people. Boy, who does that sound like? Remember Jesus and the Pharisees. Making his way across the dozens upon dozens of tribal territories, he was at constant risk and trial. He was even enslaved again for a short time. But it was his steady conviction that carried and sustained him. As he said, I came to Ireland to preach the good news. I have had many hard times, even to the point of being enslaved again, but I traded my free birth for the good of others. Well, over the years of his ministry, Patrick discipled and ordained Irish ministers. He founded many churches. He baptized thousands upon thousands of Christians. Other missionaries had gone to Ireland and others would follow, but none would leave the mark on Ireland, the mark of God on that people like Patrick through the faithful proclamation of the gospel and its purity and power. And that in the teeth of every manner of opposition and trial. Now, dear flock, Patrick was a great missionary and an exemplary ambassador for Christ. And when I say exemplary, what I mean by that, and what I mean to say is that you and I must imitate his faith. That's what the Bible requires of us. This is our calling, too, to make disciples of all nations. Now, you may uh, not have had a dream of the Irish calling you or the Egyptian or the Asian or the African to come and walk among us, and I'm not saying that every single one of us in this sanctuary is called to move to the, more, uh, to the foreign mission field. Some of you are. May well be called to do just exactly that. And maybe 
Maybe by the Holy Spirit, you're sensing that call even this morning, that the Lord is calling you to leave and to become a missionary in foreign lands. But either way, all of us, every single one of us, must bear this responsibility because God has laid it on us, and also the high, high privilege, and it is. There's no privilege we have in the world like this one, save worship itself to obey the Lord's commission to go and make disciples of all nations. I tell you, I am, I am proud in the godly sense of that word. I am happy to serve a church that makes world missions a priority. Not all pastors get to enjoy this kind of church. We have, over the years slowly given more and more and more of the church's budget over to the work of world evangelism. We, uh, we've made prayer for our missionaries a priority in worship, and especially in our weekly prayer meeting, the powerhouse of this church's missions. We've had many missionaries come and challenge us in this regard, and many of you support those missionaries yourselves with gifts through the church and on your own. It's pleasing to know that we are members of a denomination with one of the highest per capita world mission forces in all of American Christianity, of American evangelicalism. Yet I fear, judging from my own heart, that our passion for world missions may not be all that we know it should be or that we want it to be. What is it that's going to feed our passion, light our fire, as it were, for world missions? What will make of us, of this congregation, a more faithful church, more obedient, more enthusiastic, more passionate for world missions? Well, surely, as Pastor John Piper of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minnesota uh, said, surely one of those things will be to remember that most glorious story in all of world history, the spread of Christianity through the blood and tears and joy of Christian missionaries, of world missions. This is why I'm so often at pains to remind you from this pulpit, dear flock, about the David Livingstons and the John Paytons and the, and the Amy Carmichaels and, and the Jim Elliots and the William Careys uh, and the Irenaeuses and so on. The, and yes, the Patricks of church history and the apostles before them who, out of their passion for the lost, willingly left the comforts of hearth and home to deliver the gospel to people who, in many cases, returned hostility for their love, shed their blood as a reward for their sacrifice. Was their love of God? I have three questions for you, dear ones, this morning. First, what is it that has driven these men and women from the days of Jesus to the present to go and to make disciples of the nations? What is it that's driven them? And what's going to kindle the, the, the fire in our hearts and in our lives? Well, the answer is simple. It's a passion for the glory and the preeminence of Christ. That's what it is. Right at the very center of it all. It's a passion for God's glory, for the glory of Christ, for His name. World missions is, after all, about seeing the gospel of God's kingdom proclaimed in all the earth. It's, it's about pursuing the day when all the world will bow in submission to God and to His Christ. Over and again, this is the, the Bible's, uh, ex the, God's express purpose in Scripture, that His name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, hardly could our part in this role be captured better than it is in Isaiah chapter 12, to make known his deeds among the peoples, to proclaim that his name is exalted. God, as 
Piper is fond of saying, God loves his glory. God loves his glory. God is passionately committed to his fame. This is his highest priority, that he be admired, that he be known, that he be trusted and enjoyed as an infinitely glorious king. This is the good news of the kingdom. This is the goal of missions. Or as Paul said in Romans 15, that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. Now, that being God's highest priority, that he be known and worshipped and glorified in all the earth, what must our highest priority be? That he be known, that he be worshipped in all the earth, and at whatever cost to ourselves. A second question, why were they so confident as they proclaimed the gospel? And, and what must be our confidence as we engage in world missions? Well, simply this, God will do this according to his own promise. God will do this. And this gospel of the kingdom, this is Jesus Jesus speaking, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end would come. Now, Jesus was in no habit of tossing out empty platitudes, was he? This is his promise, and this is our confidence, just as it was Patrick's confidence in Ireland. You know, often... Oftentimes, Patrick came back to that very passage. In fact, he fully and, and completely expected that that promise was literally coming true in his ministry in Ireland. You see, Ireland, in the thinking of his day, was the end of the earth. It was, not literally, of course, but it was as far as habitable places went. It was, in their minds, the limit. Patrick was self-conscious about this, that his ministry was key to ushering in the coming of the kingdom of Christ. He wrote to the, the bishops, the British bishops, thus, God heard my prayers so that I, foolish though I am, might dare to undertake such a holy and wonderful mission in these last days that I in my own way, might be like those God said would come to preach and be witnesses to the good news to all non-believers before the end of the world. You see, Patrick knew that he was doing the work of God that was sure to be accomplished because it was God's work according to God's own promise. Remember Jesus saying, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What was Ireland at that time with the gates of hell? What that means for you today, brothers and sisters, is that if you are not engaged in some way today in global evangelism, that is, you are either going or you are sending. It's not God's kingdom that's going to suffer. It's you. You who are going to lose out. God's cause is not going to lose. But you will. Here's Piper again. His triumph is never in question, only our participation in it or our incalculable loss. We can be drunk with private concerns and indifferent to the great enterprise of world evangelism, but God will simply pass over us and do His great work while we shrivel up in our little land of comfort. Take confidence, brothers and sisters. God's plan, His will, 
will be accomplished. You know, like the green dye spreading in the waters of the uh, Chicago River yesterday morning until the whole river was flowing uh, green. So the knowledge of the Lord is spreading and will spread, continues to spread over the face of the globe. What a great thing for us to be engaged during our short time on the earth in this great worldwide enterprise. Every ounce of energy you expend, every dollar you give, every sacrifice you make, every investment you make in world missions bears manifold and eternal reward. There is no investment like this as far as returns go. Which brings me to the third and final question. How is it accomplished? How is the gospel spread through the nations? Well, brace yourselves for the answer. It is spread through suffering. Suffering was not a mere adjunct to Patrick's ministry in Ireland, nor was it just the result of it. Suffering was one of the means that God used to cause his gospel to spread powerfully over the hearts and countryside of Ireland. When the people saw Patrick was willing to undergo beatings and torture, that he was willing to go hungry and risk his life, life and limb, and even a return to slavery for their sakes, and joyfully for the gospel, that, that was the living testimony that brought them to Christ. Reminds us of the power of the gospel that that absolutely transformed the Alca Indians. Remember in Ecuador? Remember the power that was unleashed with the blood of those five missionaries mingling with the waters of the Curare? river, where the gospel has gone with the greatest power and the kingdom has most mightily advanced, it has been carried on the flow of the blood of men and women who recognize that suffering was not merely the result, but the means of their ministry. Some of the message of Christ's sacrifice is best understood Not just when it's spoken, but when it's lived. Surely this is something what Paul meant, right? When he was uh, writing so strikingly, strikingly to the Colossians, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. For the sake of his body, that is the church. Lacking in Christ's afflictions? Is that what he just said? It's not that Christ's afflictions are not enough to satisfy for sin. Of course it is. That was Paul's own message. But what Paul's or any missionary sufferings do is to provide a visible demonstration of the love of Christ for those to whom the gospel must come. Joseph Son, the Romanian pastor who risked his life teaching and preaching under the communist regime until he was exiled in 1981, put it this way in his book, Suffering, Martyrdom, and Rewards in Heaven. Quote, Suffering and martyrdom have been seen as part of God's plan They are his instruments by which he achieves his purposes in history and by which he will accomplish his final purpose with man. End quote. Remember Jesus telling us, they will deliver you up to tribulation. They will put you to death, said Jesus. You will be hated by all the nations for my sake. For my namesake. 
Again, he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Some of you they will put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. Brothers and sisters, suffering is simply part and parcel of the Christian package. Sacrifice is synonymous with your name. And specifically when it comes to missions. If I tell you no one in glory today regrets having made a single sacrifice in this life. Indeed, they say instead with David Livingston, the missionary to Africa, in his famous speech to the students of Cambridge University in 1857, remember what he said? I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. That's what the saints in glory who have gone before us and so faithfully seen the gospel spread in the world are saying today. <laughs> Dear flock, there is no privilege in the world. You and I have no privilege like this or duty so great, save what we're doing right now, worshiping, as bringing the gospel to the nations. No privilege so great. And now God is calling you Every single one of you and all of us together as a congregation, even on this St. Patrick's Day, there are three choices all of us can make. One of three choices when it comes to world missions. You ready for this? You've got three choices. You can be a goer, or you can be a sender. Or you can be disobedient. Those are your choices. You're either going on the mission field or you're sending people to the mission field or you're disobeying. There's no third and there's no fourth option. But whether you're a sender or a goer, and may I say again, and may I have your attention, please? Who of you is the Lord calling to go right now? Whom are we going to send from this congregation to the uttermost parts of the world? I say whether you're a, send, a goer or a sender, and may the Lord raise up goers from our midst. These things are certain. World missions rises from hearts aflame for the worldwide glory and preeminence of Christ. And you will be, you will be a, 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 an effective goer or sender in direct proportion to your willingness to suffer, to make sacrifices for the sake of of Christ and his fame and his glory in the world, whether that's out on the field or right here at home, in your bank account or your pocketbook or your time, the effort you spend in prayer and joining with us in prayer. Come join us in the throbbing machinery of this church on Wednesday evenings in praying for the world and for the gospel and for our missionaries. But know this, whatever form it takes, no sacrifice you make will go unrewarded. No sacrifice you make is unnoticed by the one whose name will be worshipped in every corner of the globe. How many people wouldn't you love to run into in glory who say to you, thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sending. Thank you 
for coming so that I might find myself right here with you. In the words of Mary Thompson, give of your sons to bear the message glorious. Give of your wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out your soul for them in prayer victorious. At all your spending, Jesus will 